I'm very excited to be here today and thrilled to see something like professional sales being applied in an area outside of business because we're firm believers that everyone is in sales in some way, shape, or form, and this is an excellent competition and, and good luck to everyone in this. Our agenda for today is we want to first and foremost talk about customer perspective because as Laura mentioned, you know, the judges for this competition are not necessarily from the science area. And, and moving forward, one of the goals of this competition is to help you commercialize and monetize your innovation. And so we need to think about who our customers are and, and, and what's important to them and what's going to motivate them so that we make sure that our pitch is going to resonate with them. Part of that is something that we're going to need to address are the communication elements, the issue of creativity, and then also more of the science aspect of what you're going to be doing with your pitch what is your elevator pitch format and an outline and what that needs to look like. And then specifically when you go about putting in the specific words and syntax, how can we go about making our pitch relevant and compelling to fully explain our value proposition? The first thing that we need to understand about doing an elevator pitch is what the effect is that we're trying to get. And effect is one of the areas on the grading scale, so to speak, for how your pitch is going to be evaluated. And essentially, your goal for this elevator pitch is to get the audience to say, tell me more. In three minutes, you're not going to be able to pour out your life's work, or at least the semester's work <laughs> on this. But you know, get them, whet their appetites to want to learn more about, um, learn more about your innovation. Elevator pitches can be used in a variety of different settings. They can be used in informal social settings where somebody says, you know, tell me again, you know, what is it that you do? It's a great conversation starter. Also, you know, moving forward as you're going to be giving presentations, workshops, um, or maybe a speech that you're going to be doing, just some form of an introduction for yourself so people understand who you are and, and what you bring to the table. Also great when you're doing networking at meetings or conferences and workshops. Once again, just as a way for people to know who you are, introducing potential new colleagues about yourself, because a lot of times when you're at these events, you're looking for new research partners or things where you might be able to collaborate. So what is the quick and dirty, so to speak, on what you bring to the table and what your interests are? It's also a great thing that you can use in your cover letters as you go out to try and get jobs post-college or just you know even afterwards when you're trying to get a job. Typically, this is something that you would put in the second paragraph of your cover letter to explain who you are, and then that dreaded interview question. So tell me about yourself, because um, there is a, a right way and a not so right way to go about answering those questions. Um, even though companies might have you know, very warm, welcoming, family-oriented cultures, um, very few organizations are going to want to hear about the fact that you were the oldest of three children and you grew up in Northwest Ohio or whatever the case might be. They're going to want to know about the things about you that are relevant to them and the position that you are interviewing for. And also, as you're getting ready to do your pitch, it's very important that you customize your pitch as much as possible. You only have, in the case of this competition, three minutes, and that's not very much time, but it is enough time to get your main point across. And so anything you can do to customize it so that it resonates with your audience and they can see how it applies to them would, do, would be a great idea. So doing anything in terms of background research or any sort of information gathering you can do prior to make sure that your pitch is as well positioned as possible. Now, um, for the purpose of the rapid impact competition, you get three minutes, which is a blessing for you, so please use them wisely. Um, typically, though, elevator pitches are much shorter than that, because if you think about the name elevator pitch, how long are you spending in the elevator? Um, traditionally, when, student, when people are asked to do elevator pitches, you want to have two different versions. You want to have the quick and dirty one that's 30 to 60 seconds, so obviously a very short, quick elevator ride. This is part of why Twitter is probably so popular is because it's, it's a tweet. It's 140 characters, you know, 35 words or less, just literally just the meat and potatoes of what it is that you want to get across. Another form of an elevator pitch is still considered short. It's about 350 words and takes approximately one to two minutes to, de to deliver. So once again, three minutes on the competition, and you might think it's not that much time, but trust me, from the judging perspective, it is plenty of time to get a sense of what the innovation is and what you can um, learn from that. I'm sure people have heard or seen the research in terms of how long it takes for people to form impressions and get excitement, and that's just a matter of seconds. So when you have three minutes, you can really see how much potential you have to make an impact. 
looking at the customer perspective, I want to take a step to talk about what we like to refer to as joint venture selling. Because what you're doing is to, you need to put yourself in the customer's shoe, put yourself in the judge's shoes, and you know future um, customers that might be buying your product that you're putting out there, and obviously the investors as well. And there are two things that you need to sell your customer on. And those two things are, um, number one, we need to sell them on the concept of change. And the second thing you need to sell them on is change with me. And these are things that you can be making the sale, so to speak, um, simultaneously, but you have to make sure that they are sold on that concept of change before you can sell them on the whole concept of changing with me. Because anybody that has been doing sales, formally or informally, will know that people might like you, they think this is, it's a decent idea, but they just don't see the need or the urgency to change. And so we don't want to have that happen. We don't want to lose, essentially, to nothing, lose to status quo. Because, and this is one of the great things about you know, innovations, we are all standing on the shoulders of the giants and the people that came before us. Because everything is built on something that was already done, and we're taking that body of work, and we're making a, a minor, or in some cases, a major adjustment or a change to that. And because of that, we need to make sure we are selling people on the concept of change first, and then change with me. And that might seem a little counterintuitive because it's like, well, this is it's self-evident why this is so awesome or why this is so great. And and while parts of it might be, we cannot we cannot ignore the fact that people are typically risk averse. They don't like change. And so once again, sell them on concept of change. What you'll see on the graphic on the screen here, this is the customer's decision making process. And this is why selling the concept of change and then change with me is so important because, and you know, they're numbered one, two, three, but these, the size of the circle relates to how much time the customer is spending in each one of these stages. And so that first stage, which is also where they're spending most of their time, is this cognitive thinking stage. And what happens here is that they have that first, they have that epiphany light bulb moment of, I have a problem and it needs to be fixed, or, because it doesn't have to be a negative thing, there is an opportunity that I would like to leverage and take advantage of. So they have to have that light bulb moment. There's a problem that needs to be fixed, or there is an opportunity that I would like to leverage and take advantage of. Once they identify the fact that there is something that they need to do, they need to explore the why, the catalyst for change aspect of it. Well, why do I need to change this? Or why do I want to take advantage of this? And what's going on around me? What's my situation and my goals? And what are the implications of doing this or not doing this? because sometimes people need to feel that sense of urgency to change and what's the benefit if I actually do this you know and obviously the opportunity cost of not doing this what am I leaving behind if I don't do it and so consequently that is a long and involved process and this is where we need to get involved with our customers because once again they need to know that they should be changing and why they should change after they understand that they should change because they need there's a problem that needs to be fixed or there's an opportunity they want to leverage and they know why and they have that sense of urgency, then they move into divergent thinking. And in divergent thinking, that's where they start to evaluate all of their different options. But keep in mind, when they're evaluating their options, they established selection criteria and determined what that bar looks like prior in that cognitive thinking stage. And once again, that's why you need to get involved earlier on in their thought process, because if you're the one that helps them understand, number one, that there's something they need to change about, and number two, what they stand to gain, um, that sense of urgency, that implication of the opportunity cost if they don't change and if they maintain status quo. If you get involved over there, that's where they see you as that advisor, that consultant, and that's really where you get to leverage and shine with your subject matter expertise, with your innovation. And questions are your best sales tool. So you want to ask those questions, get involved early, because then when they get to divergent thinking and they explore the options, they are using a measuring stick that you created. And then that's what they're using to measure and evaluate all the different options. And consequently, you become the forerunner because you set the bar in that respect. After they get done evaluating all their options, they then move into that third and final stage, which is once again the shortest, convergent thinking, where they converge on a solution and pick the one that they feel is going to be the best option for them. So once again, get involved early, 
making sure that they understand the concept of change, what they stand to gain, and then sell them on changing with me. Because that changing with me, if you're, if you're selling on concept of change from the get-go, that whole concept of change with me goes hand in hand because they see you as that value-added partner, advisor, consultant, if you will. Now, we don't want that message to just go to anyone. Um, you really need to make sure that you are talking to the right people because if you are not talking to the right people, you don't even have a chance to hit the ball. And I'm going to use a drinking analogy up here, if you will, so bear with me. Um, and these are stereotypes, by the way, so I just want to clar clarify that. When you are talking with people, you want to make sure that you are talking to decision makers and not necessarily the users of your product or your service or whatever it is that you have that you've innovated and created because the users are like these wine drinkers that I have the, 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 cro the slash through because the wine drinkers they're interested in all the technical specifications and all of the little details you know the body the flavor they get so caught up in the details that sometimes they don't see the big picture and because they're so hung up on details they're more likely to say no because they see little things that may or may not fit and so they want to um, you know, take it off the table, so to speak. But our beer drinkers, on the other hand, beer drinkers just want to get drunk. They're end results oriented. And so, once again, that's what a decision maker is. They're end results oriented. Not that they don't care about the details, but they're more concerned about end result and, and, and is this going to get me where I need to be, yes or no. And then, obviously, they will work with, you know, what we would call a center of influence. It's not that the, the gatekeepers or the technicals and the users are not going to be involved, because they will, but ultimately the, the power lies with the decision maker who is the one that's looking for the end result. And so that's why we need to start by making sure we're talking to the right people and having conversations with decision makers and making sure that we are focusing our conversation on end result and benefit, because fundamentally that's what people are interested in and buying. Now, for the outline, of your elevator pitch. Um, this is what, when you look at the, um, the criteria sheet, they're referring to as content. Essentially, there are four different things you need to hit on in this content section. The first thing is, what does your company or innovation do? Because you need to think long term. Where do you see yourself going? What, what, is this, what is it that you're going to do? But related to that is, who do you or who can you help? So who's your customer? Who's your market? And then immediately, the next follow-up question to that is, why do they care? Essentially, you need to keep asking yourself, so what? So who can you help? Why do they care? And then, this, this last one's really important, why are you different? Because once again, people need to see what the difference is between you and somebody else, because if they're looking at two red apples, they're gonna go with the cheaper one. And with innovations and cutting edge technology and science, that doesn't necessarily, you're typically not the cheapest. You're typically going to cost a little bit more. And so you need to make sure that you are establishing the value of what you bring to the table and making sure that you see why you're different. Number one, that's going to decrease the importance of price. And the other part of it is it's going to help tilt the scales in your favor because they can see the difference between you and somebody else. Because when you think about it from the customer's perspective, they're trying to put everybody in the same box, line you all up, and see how you're the same but it's really the differences that are going to help to get you noticed. So making sure that you are highlighting why you are different. The communication aspect of this, when you look at your criteria sheet, they're going to be looking at this as the execution portion. And the first thing you need to look at is your verbiage. I strongly, strongly encourage you to type this out. We cannot have an off-the-cuff conversation about you know, your innovation and, and what it brings to the table. We want to make sure that it's concise. You only have three minutes. Choose your words wisely. And we also want to make sure that the verbiage we're using is professional. Um, one of the things that we see as a, a trend, and maybe it's just the University of Toledo, but I've spoke with enough students and enough other universities at competitions and conferences to, to see that it's a little bit more widespread, but is you guys. So try and, and take that particular phrase, if you will, out of your language, out of your, your lexicon, if you will, and do that. Um, you just want to make sure that you're as professional as possible when you're proposing this, because once again, you're proposing, you're trying to, you know, in this case, win a competition, and, you know, down the road, it's about monetizing your innovation and commercializing it, and, they, and that's a business. 
Elocution is another part. You want to make sure you're speaking clearly, enunciating, hitting all of your consonants, and trying to not meditate and using ums and uhs while you're speaking. Now, some people don't use ums and uhs. Some people will use filler words such as okay, right, you know. And once again, just be aware of, of what you do and what you say. And as a side note to all of these other ones that I'm going to talk about, I would pre-record yourself, you know, get the box of tissues, you'll laugh, you'll cry. But, you know, hear yourself and watch yourself so you can see some of these things on yourself because the camera does not lie. Energy is another part of this. And I think energy is one of those things that some people, they have energy and they know it and they just exude it. And then other times you really need to watch yourself on camera to realize, wow, I'm not, I need to, you know, step up the pep a little bit. And you don't need to be cheerleader perky when you're going through it, but you do need to be enthusiastic about your subject matter and confident about it. Confidence really sells. And if you're not going to be enthusiastic and confident about your innovation and what it brings to the table and why this is different and why this is going to help and, and be important, and, and it's your baby, then you, know, you can't expect, whether it's a competition judge or a potential investor, potential customer, to get all jazzed up about it. So energy is going to be really, really important. Also helps to give them confidence and transfer that to them as well. Um, sincerity. You know, we can't teach sincerity, but, you know, it's, it's definitely worth mentioning that you need to be an authentic and genuine individual, and that goes right hand in hand with being able to establish a relationship and having that element of trust and respect in a relationship. Also in your communication, your volume and your speed. Are you composed when you're talking? Are you audible? Can people hear you when you're speaking? Can they understand you, or are you talking too fast or too slow? The time limit aspect of it, for purposes of the competition, you have three minutes. But, you know, if you have a meeting or a presentation, you know, confirm what the parameters are in advance because you don't want to overstay your welcome and stay longer than expected. But if you know that it's going longer, you know, ask for a follow-up appointment or say, you know, is it okay if we keep going? And if things are going well, they're going to give you the extra 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes that you need if things are really going well and they genuinely have the time. They're going to like the fact that you're respecting that. And then we have the nonverbals, and nonverbals are huge. Um, sometimes my husband will tell me that I yell. You know, I, it's very rare for me to raise my voice, but do I snap my neck? Do I get a look? Do I get a tongue? On occasion. All right, but that's why your nonverbals are so important to the communication, because it actually communicates far more than the verbal content of what you're saying. So we want to make sure we're paying attention to our posture. I don't know if you're going to be doing your pitch sitting or standing, but we do need to make sure that we are standing or sitting straight, shoulders rolled back. If we are standing, making sure that our legs are shoulder width apart so we're not teeter-tottering or that we're not you know, leaning from one, one area to the next or shifting weights and kind of having our hip you know, cocked up or down um, with our posture. Eye contact is going to be huge. I know it might be a little funny talking to a camera. Um, hopefully you have some other people there that you know you can focus your attention on them. If not, maybe you don't want them in the room, you just want it to be quiet and silent, that's great too, but you still feel funny. Get some pictures and you know, or print someone's face to a whole eight by eight and a half by eleven sheet and tape it right behind the camera and then talk to that. So but eye contact is really going to be huge because it's a way for you to establish a connection and a relationship with someone and it just makes it more intimate. So definitely try and make eye contact. Use your facial expressions. Raise your eyebrows to emphasize a point uh, when you're talking. Once again, it also helps with the level of energy that you have. So your face is full of emotions that you can use to help convey energy and excitement and confidence um, about your innovation. And also related to facial expressions, and I have this on here separately, but smile. Smiling makes you approachable. It makes you seem happy. And once again, it helps with energy on your presentation. Also, we want to pay attention to our dress and our attire and how we look when we are doing our presentation. So once again, you need to take a look at you know, what the context is of the presentation. Um, this is a competition. We're looking to you know, monetize things down the road. I clean yourself up, <laughs> you know, um, you know, wearing you know, something that looks more professional um, with your attire on that, making sure that things are ironed and pressed and that they're laying right that they coordinate when it comes to your hair, making sure it's well-groomed. Ladies, get your hair off your face. Um, light makeup would probably be a, a good idea. 
Um, keep your jewelry simple, nothing that's going to, to clang or be distracting or be unsafe, depending on if maybe you have to do a demonstration with what you're doing, because we don't want any accessories to be or, or hair to be a distraction on that. Also be mindful of any movement you might be doing and making sure that what you're wearing still allows for the right kind of movement. Sometimes if you're going to be bending or leaning, you want to make sure that um, things are covered, but that you still have the right level of movement to get certain things done. We also want to stay with more neutral and safe colors. As fun as a bright turquoise dress shirt might be, we might want to refrain from wearing that because once again, we want the attention to be on your presentation and on your innovation and not on what you're wearing. So I would stay away from bright colors, really bold patterns, and also on video. Stripes look terrible on video, so refrain from wearing stripes on a video, it can make people a little nutty when they're taking a look at that. So, and then also, I mean, we, there's things we could talk about forever with dress, and I would refer you to take a look at, you know, you know, career networking websites to take a look at, you know, things that would be, be appropriate from a dress perspective. But you know, typically safe, neutral colors, a um, little bit of makeup, keep the hair off the face, keep the accessories simple, and then just making sure you're well presented um, with looking clean with the makeup and and guys shave. <laughs> I know you might not want to hear that, but um, when you take a look at individuals that are in leadership roles and whatnot, you're not going to find a whole lot of uh, facial hair out there when it comes to um, men in leadership positions. So just some things in terms of perception and how people are going to look. And then also body art. Uh, make sure the body art is not visible. If there are any piercings that need to be removed, please remove them. Um, because once again, we want the emphasis to be on your innovation and what it brings to the table and, and reduce any sort of distractions in that respect. Creativity. Um, to be creative or not to be creative could be um, a bit of a gamble, but this is an opportunity for you to, you know, let that creative side of you, of, of you shine because there are things that you could do, especially with, you know, whatever the particular science or method or principle that you're using and get creative with it because what creativity enables you to do and why you know they have it as a separate grade item is it enables you to make a deeper connection and to better articulate your value proposition to the audience because if you can compare it or draw a parallel to your innovation and you know previous innovations or other principles or rules but things you know and I have just a, a list up here you know songs and music art food, entertainment, if you can draw a parallel to that, it, it, it establishes that connection where somebody's like, okay, yeah, I get that, I understand. I mean, just to provide some brief examples, um, we always encourage our students um, in the SEALS program, we make them do a two-minute elevator pitch on themselves and why a company would want to interview and hire him or her for a sales career, and we encourage them to be creative with it. Obviously, we don't want them to get real cheesy and Velveeta with it, but there's things that they can do to help you know, improve and enhance the, their communication skills. And so some of our students have chose to compare themselves to um, you know, a, a, a royal flush in a hand of poker, or why they're the multivitamin of sales, or the Iron Man of sales. And so there's different things that play on some of their interests, you know, why they're a five course meal or why, you know, working with them is, you know, working, you know, with an artist and so they go through different things about art or how to bake a dish. And it's just it's a way for you to be creative to explain things to establish that sort of a connection. I think the most um, creative one in terms of being entertaining, I had a student once compare himself to the Ghostbusters. And that one that one did walk the line with being a little hokey at times, but nonetheless, it was definitely one of the most memorable as well because it was very creative in terms of how he made some of the parallels. Um, other things that you can do from a creativity perspective, do a demonstration of your innovation so they actually get to see it if that's something that's possible. Um, do some sort of a trial as well, and that's obviously related to a demonstration. And then providing proof sources. Do you already have testing or data or things that you can share with them? So maybe you can provide them, and it doesn't necessarily have to be quant related data, I mean that would be, because some of your stuff's not going to lend itself to quant or maybe you don't have all, the, all, of the, all of the research data back yet in terms of how well something did. And so maybe all you have are qualitative data sources. You have quotes from potential customers or clients or faculty members, fellow researchers. So anything that you can do to enhance your credibility and be creative with it would be a really good idea to help you stand out. Now, getting back into how you can help 
your customers and what's important to them, I want to draw your attention to something called return on investment, ROI. When you are thinking about your product or your service or whatever it is that your innovation is doing, what you need to boil it down to is you are increasing a business positive or decreasing a business negative. Pure and simple. That is what your innovation is. Yes, this is science, but ultimately, if this science is going to be worth anything, it needs to be able to translate to something on the business side of things. And so that's what you need to think about is, all right, you know, because what it does is are all features, and we'll talk about features and benefits in a little bit, but you need to be able to boil your innovation down to what sort of a business positive am I increasing? Am I able to increase revenue, improve image, retention, enhancing productivity, strengthening relationships, you know, and the list goes on. But what business positive am I, am I improving? And also, maybe you're doing two, multiple things, and I'm hoping your innovation can do multiple things because that makes it that much more compelling. But what are the business negatives that you are decreasing? Do you decrease cost? Are you saving time? Are you mitigating risk? Are you eliminating or reducing waste? So those are other things that we want to take a look at. And that's if you can identify all the business positives that you're increasing and all the business negatives that you're decreasing, that's your value proposition. That's the return on investment that somebody's going to get when they buy your product or if they're going to invest any capital in your venture. So that's really important. Boil it down to, and you might need to ask yourself a series of so what questions. So what? And what's the result of this? How is this going to help? Keep peeling the onion. Peel those layers back until you get to that smelly core because that's the essence. That's what you are fundamentally bringing to the table and why your innovation is going to have an impact. Now, that increasing a business positive or decreasing a business negative, that is the benefit. That is the need payoff. That is why people are going to, you know, you're going to win the competition or you're going to get financing for your investment or somebody's going to hire you to join their firm so you can help their business. People buy for their reasons and not yours. Um, think about something as simple as popsicle sticks, right? Um, people buy popsicle sticks for a variety of different reasons. You can get popsicle sticks at the grocery store because you want to make popsicles, right? You can also buy popsicle sticks at a craft and art supply store because maybe you want to make a little house or a little box or something of that nature. And you know, medical supplies are also interested in popsicle sticks because you can use them as a tongue depressor from a healthcare perspective. It's the exact same product but people are buying it for different uses and different applications. And so you need to be aware of that as well when it comes to your own innovation. Why would they want to buy this? How is this going to help them? Because we can't put everybody into a box and say, well, look, this is why you're going to care. We need to acknowledge the fact that there's a variety of different audiences and there's a variety of different ways in which they can leverage this. Because they're only interested in those features. They're only interested in all those little cool bells and whistles because they provide a benefit. Right? So why is that neat? So what? You know, another example that we have here is do you call an exterminator because you want toxic chemicals in your house? Or are you interested in the benefit, which is not having any more pests in your house? So we need to be mindful of that. Now, specifically when we're talking about features, when I say features, I'm referring to the physical characteristics, operations, and actions of your product or service. And this can also include company information as well. And so we're talking about marketing materials, a mutual fund, and expense ratios, and you know, heating and air product and repair services, or you know, in the case of selling our sales program, you know, our sales courses, and the fact that we have a major. These are all features, and features exist because they provide benefits. Because once again, so what? Why are they there? And so you might have specifications on your innovation. Maybe it's weight, or it's color, or the material that it's made out of or how fast something can go. And that's, you know, I'm sure growing up, you have watched at least one Charlie Brown holiday special. And how does that teacher sound in Charlie Brown? She sounds wah, 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 wah. That is what customers hear when all you do is talk about features. They hear wah, 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 wah. Because what they're interested in, they're interested in the benefits, the so what. Because when your customer or potential investor hears about financial security and wealth management or extending the life of your home comfort system or exposing and promoting your company to your target customers, those things you see on the screen right now in bold, those are the benefits. Those are the so what. That's the end result. It's that return on investment. It's that 
business positive that you're increasing or that business negative that you're decreasing, that's what people care about. And so when you're talking, they're just hearing wah, 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 and then all of a sudden they are snapped into active listening when they hear you talk about the benefit, the so what aspect um, of, of, of what's useful or what's profitable for them. So if you take you know, just the first couple of examples, you, know, you had that feature of marketing promotions. Well, what's the benefit? What's the so what on that? Well, the benefit of having marketing promotional materials is we help to expose and promote your company to your target customers, enabling you to stand out from the competition. And when it comes to investment planning and insurance, what's the so what on that? You know, we offer expertise in financial security and wealth management that will give you peace of mind for a lifetime. So always ask yourself, so what, so what, why is the customer going to care? Because I mentioned that term active listening, but customers spend, um, and just people in general, people, there's three different types of listening, active, evaluative, and marginal. And that marginal listening, you know, those are the people that fall asleep in class and have no idea the teacher's talking to them. You know, or you're in a meeting and you don't even know the meeting's over, or they've moved on to the next phase. But most people spend most of their time in evaluative listening. And just as the name implies, it's evaluative. You are evaluating the statements that you're hearing and waiting for things that are going to trigger, oh, this is important, I need to know this, or, oh, I'm going to start listening more because now I see how this applies to me. What triggers somebody out of evaluative listening and into active listening, where they listen, hear, and understand, and they get the emotional aspect of what's going on, the benefit statements. Because once again, what business positive are you increasing? What business negative are you decreasing? That's when they all of a sudden snap into active listening. Why waste all of the other really cool things about your product or service and lead with that and then let them go into active listening after you say what the benefit is at the end of that statement? So what we want you to do is lead with the benefit in your writing and orally when you're talking, lead with the benefit to snap them into active listening. That way you have their attention from the get-go. And then you can go into the nuts and bolts of how your um, innovation actually works and accomplishes the things that you talk about. Um, related to that is how you're going to go about presenting the solution. And you'll see in your criteria sheet they will refer to this as the originality aspect of what's going on. And when I talked about leading with the benefits and then describing relevant features, you'll see that that's the second bullet point that I have over here. But that's so important is to lead with the benefit and go in order of importance for the customer. You always want to go with the heavy hitters, the ones that you know are going to have the most impact. The other thing is, in terms of being original and presenting your solution, is you want to acknowledge the customer's need and acknowledge the situation. We need to set the stage for where your innovation fits and respecting their point of view, knowing who your audience is. And then, you know, if you have a better relationship with people, you know, moving forward outside of the context of this competition, make sure you're using language that's better suited for your customer's social style. People have different types of social styles. You will see a variety of different labels. Um, you know, fundamentally, you know, you're looking at drivers, analytics, amiables, and expressives. Sometimes you'll hear different labels on that. But, you know, different social styles like to, um, they, interpret and um, intake information differently based on their social style. They also communicate differently. They prefer to see things in a different way. So, I mean, things, you know, word choice, how fast you're going, how much detail you go into. Do they want pictures? Do they want examples? Do they want charts and graphs? Do they want you to go fast? Do they want you to go slow, certain colors? All different things that you can take into account moving forward. But the important thing is that you understand that you need to acknowledge the customer's need, acknowledge their situation, because it's the situation that sets the stage for you to talk about what your benefits are that you bring to the table that will help them with their situation. Because once again, we're talking about return on investment, improving a business positive, decreasing a business negative. And once again, we see stressing unique strengths up here again because we have to differentiate ourselves so that we stand out and also to help decrease the importance of price moving forward. Other things that are going to help to improve the originality of your solution is to be able to prove and or demonstrate your value proposition. Show them what the measurable impact is going to be. If there's nothing measurable you can share at this particular point in time because it's so early stage, you know, what do you hypothesize is going to happen? Do you have any stories or anything that's anecdotal that you can share with them to prove or demonstrate what your ROI is going to be and, and what they can expect to get out of that? Involving the customer is going to be important if there's anything you can do to, to get them involved and engaged in the presentation would be wonderful. And then also providing and discussing multiple solutions 
with your customer. People love having options. And so it's important that even though your innovation might be fantastic, if all you're putting on the table is this one innovation and that's it, you're essentially giving the customer and, an invest and the investors an ultimatum. You take this one innovation or you leave it. And, and that's, that, that's, that's pretty black and white. And so what you want to do is provide different options for them to choose from. You know, I mean, the simple, straightforward one is, you know, you've got entry level, middle of the road, and high end. But maybe, you know, your niche is high end, and, and that's what you specialize in. And we certainly don't want you to compromise your, your image and your quality for that. But even within the area of high end or cutting edge technology or whatnot, you can still find ways to create different options or different flavors, if you will, of your innovation. And so that's important as well, because if your innovation is really going to grow, you know, penetrate, radiate, and replace in the marketplace, you need to make sure that you have a clear path and a clear game plan for how you see your innovation evolving and progressing over time. And providing options and thinking the next couple of steps ahead are going to be a really important um, means for you to do that. Now, to develop your pitch, in summary, the things that you are looking to do um, when you do your pitch, you want to lead off by stating your name, um, a title if you have one, um, your role, and then the organization that you're representing so that they know who they're dealing with and where you're from. You always want to be gracious and thank the audience for their interest because they are spending some of their busy time with you. And then this next part is we want to provide a brief overview of your company and the customers you serve. So see, you know, I've got a lot of bullet points here, but see how much of your presentation can cover, you know, what, you know, what benefits does your organization provide? Who do you work with? What's your value proposition? What's, what's key? What's different about you? What does your ideal customer look like? What sort of a profile would they have? If there's anyone prominent that you've worked with, you know, um, who is that? So how do things benefit the customer? So take a look at all these different things. And once again, this is a brief overview. Keep in mind, still only three minutes to get all of this across. And then after you provide the brief overview of your company and your customer base, because remember, we need to set the stage, market need, then we get into the key advantages of working, competitive strengths, differentiators, and what makes you unique. Because once again, we are selling them on the concept of change and then change with me. So this item number three up here, the brief overview of your company and your customers and your general value proposition, this is where the concept of change happens because we're setting the stage. Who's your market? Why do they care? Once again, business positives going up, business negatives going down. And, and that's what we're taking a look at here. Item number four is change with me because these are key advantages of working with your company. So what are your key strengths? What makes you different? What makes you unique? And in some cases, you might be sitting here thinking, well, yeah, I'm a little different, you know, but the other part of it is, how long would it take for a competitor to come up with what, you've, what, with what you came up with? How hard is it to copy or emulate what you're doing? And that's the other thing you need to take into consideration is because, you know, once again, that's market advantage. Being the first mover is an advantage, but how much of a head start does that actually give you, you know? And, Obviously, you know, there's copywriting, patents, and whatnot that can help to extend that. But once again, item number three, the overview on your company, the concept of change, what's the value proposition, what's the market need, what can I do to help with that, and then number four, what are the key advantages of working with your company? This is why me? Why change with me? So set yourself apart over here. And then at the end, you have got to ask for the sale. You've got to close this because sales is a fundamentally a four-step process, preparation, getting information, giving information, and then getting commitment. It's a lot like dating. You're preparing, you're getting ready, you ask them questions about you know, their childhood growing up, and movies that they like, and food that they like, and then you're sharing information about yourself too, and it's all just flirting. But fundamentally, you need to ask them out on a date. Ask them to go out for a cup of coffee, or out to a movie, or out to dinner. You need to do the exact same thing in this competition, as you need to ask for that next incremental and mutual level of commitment. So in the tech context of the, of the competition, certainly you want to ask to, to win the competition and to receive the award. But moving forward as you're taking your, your innovation um, to the next step to try and commercialize it, you know, we don't want to try and boil the ocean. It is great and you completely need to have that long-term strategic game plan and business plan for where you want to go. But you know, what are the next mutual and incremental steps that you want to take 
to advance your innovation and break it down. And that's how you're going to come up with your quarterly, monthly, weekly, and daily action plans to get your innovation and to get your dream to the next level. So always ask for that next incremental and mutual. Remember, baby steps. For the competition, definitely ask, you know, and, and be confident. Use confident language, not, you know, I think or I hope you feel, I know, I'm confident. We want to make sure we're using confident language when we're asking for our clothes. So, and there is a copy of, of this as well, because I do have this in a Microsoft Word document or a PDF file. And um, everyone can have access to this to help you as you are fleshing out your pitch. It's going to be on their website. If you go to the Global Polymer Innovation Expo.com website, and you want to look for the logo on the Rapid Impact Competition, and it's going to be located there underneath Resources. And so once again, the Global Polymer Innovation Expo.com website, look for the Rapid Impact Competition icon, and then look there underneath Resources to see this document there to help you as you're developing and, and putting your pitch together. Um, this concludes the webcast and presentation for today. I'm going to take a quick scan over on the questions to see if there's any questions that came in um, on that. So, it doesn't appear that we have anything exactly at this particular moment in time. Um, hope everyone found today's presentation helpful in terms of helping them to organize their thoughts and ideas as they're putting um, putting their, their pitch together to sell your innovation for the Rapid Impact Competition. And I want to wish everyone the best of luck moving forward with their innovation.